So I'm Sally O'Burn and I want to welcome you. Um, I have known Matt, I don't know, four or five years, something like that. Maybe longer than that. And uh, Matt had the good fortune to be a the caretaker of the Wick House, which is in Germantown, which was a home of Ruben Haynes, who was secretary of the Academy of Natural Sciences to a very important part of the ornithological time of the ornithological history and scientific knowledge history in Philadelphia. So he had all these scientists from all around the world who had come to the academy and would visit with him, and he was in touch with scientists all over the world. So this house holds a repository of a lot of stuff that was, much of it was poorly cataloged, as I understand it. So Matt, when he was caretaker there, was able to like wander through the files and explore. And that's kind of the beginning of your his, historical ornithological knowledge. And I had the good pleasure to go there once and have a back behind the scenes tour with Matthew. That was just spectacular. So um, he went to University of Delaware, but, and then he got his PhD. Delaware State. At, sorry, Delaware State. I knew it was in Delaware. Yes. <laughs> and he, now he got his PhD at Drexel, and he is now, we have the good fortune to have him as a chief ornithologist and curator of birds at the Delaware Museum of Science and Nature. And uh, he, has, he is well known in the area as a top ornithologist. He has done work on birds throughout the world, a specialty in thrushes. Yeah. And also he knows more about the history of ornithology than anyone else I know. So I'm very pleased to have him come and I was thrilled to put together this talk for us. So thank you very much. All right, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm gonna sit down for the, for the benefit of the three people on Zoom. <laughs> uh, I don't actually I don't know how many people are on Zoom. That was an yeah. off the cuff comment. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and to tell you a little bit about uh, John James Audubon and how cool that we have this orchestral soundtrack <laughs> behind us, right? It's adding a little, it's adding a little uh, ambiance to this whole drama today. Well, plenty of drama coming. I got news for you. Um, this evening, I'm going to be talking about um, a, an aspect of John James Audubon that hasn't been discussed enough. And that is that uh, he was a pseudoscientist. Um, this evening, you might hear a few things that might seem a little heretical. Um, I'm going to start off by defining pseudoscience for us. Um, Merriam-Webster Dictionary tells us that pseudoscience is a system of theories, assumptions, and methods that are erroneously regarded as a scientific. I think that's a pretty good definition. But it's kind of missing the there's there's something missing here. And there's another definition from Oxford that gives us theories, ideas or explanations that are represented as scientific, but that are not derived from science or the scientific method. So when I think of pseudoscience, I'm, I'm talking about activities that are disguised as science. They're dressed up as science. Uh, and to the to the lay person, uh, who maybe doesn't have as nuanced an understanding of a topic, uh, they, they come across as very credible because they're dressed up in this scientific disguise. So John James Audubon is a very controversial figure, a very famous figure. Uh, he was a really talented painter, grew up uh, born in Haiti, but grew up uh, for a couple of years of his life in Chester County for uh montgomery county right on the border with chester county um at a place called mill grove which is on the schuylkill river right outside of philadelphia and probably some of you have been there and he's uh well known primarily for his voluminous writing right he had 435 colored plates engraved in scotland and published in a work called the birds of america which was on this double elephant folio paper these massive because he wanted every bird to be life-size. And it was extravagant and very wasteful and expensive to have a giant page like this for a little warbler in the middle of it. 
Um, obviously, for some birds, uh, he had to contort them into uh, various shapes to fit them on the page. Some of the larger birds, the, the flamingo uh, kind of comes to mind. Um, and then after he did that, he published five octavo volumes called Ornithological Biography, which is text accounts that accompanied the 435 color plates. And each of those plates had a scientific name attached to it, a Linnaean binomial name, just like uh, that we've been using ever since 1758. Uh, we've been following this one guy's system of classifying plants and animals. And this was, uh, you know, many decades before Audubon came around is when this binomial nomenclature came into fashion. And then after that, he wrote this uh, synopsis of the birds of America. This is just a, a short volume where it's um, where he's sort of um, more technical volume. And then he finished out his career. He did publish a second edition of the birds of America in, uh, in an octavo uh, edition uh, for the folks who couldn't afford his double elephant folios. Uh, and then he sort of finished out his career with the viviparous quadrupeds of North America, which is a, a book on mammals. Um, and he lent his considerable artistic expertise to these wonderful drawings of mammals of North America. So I grew up in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, and these, uh, there's Mill Grove there on the right. And these other pins are my various childhood homes. Uh, in Phoenixville, I lived there in Kimberton in Montgomery County for a while and up in Spring City. Um, but I'm a, I grew up along the Schuylkill River. And at the time, I didn't know who Audubon was. And the name Audubon, uh, my parents had taken a vacation to Germany when I was a kid. And to me, the word Audubon was that highway where there's no speed limit. Right? You're good. <laughs> And so I, I didn't grow up as a bird watcher at all. I didn't have anybody around me watching birds. Uh, and I sort of found my way into ornithology um, by, uh, you know, happenstance. Maybe there's something in the water there in the scoople, the scoople punch, they call it. Um, so we're going to start our tale today about a famous thing that happened at Mill Grove. Uh, in 1803, as the story goes, John James Audubon tied silver threads to the legs of some Eastern Phoebes, and he called those the peewee flycatcher. And he tied it around the legs of five from one nest, and two of them returned to Mill Grove, according to the story, and he found them again in 1806, two years later, uh, he found, uh, sorry, 1804 is when he banded them in the spring, uh, and they, they came back uh, two years later, and he found them as adults breeding on the property, according to his story. And he said, I took the whole family out and blew off the excuvier of the feathers from the nest. I attached white threads to their legs. These they invariably removed, either with their bills or with the assistance of their parents, I renewed them, however, until I found the little fellows habituated to them, and at last, when they were about to leave the nest, I fixed a light silver thread to the leg of each, loose enough not to hurt the part, but so fastened that no exertions of theirs could remove it. I had ample proof afterwards that the brood of young peewees raised in the cave returned the following spring and established themselves in the uh, among the outhouses in the neighborhood, I'm sorry, further up the creek, having caught several of these birds on the nest uh, he had the pleasure of finding that two of them had the little ring on the leg. So this is the story. You'll notice that it's Audubon 1834. He is telling us this story 30 years after the events purportedly took place. And by this time, he has already been publishing a bunch, uh, Birds of America's, you know, in full swing, probably, you know, probably two thirds of the way through already. But here's the problem, right? Right away, this should raise some red flags for us because in modern day, we've done some ex we've done that experiment on Eastern Phoebes with two different studies where one where 539 nestlings are banded, and the other with 217. And look at the percentages of returns: 1.6 percent, 1.3 percent of right. So, and he's claiming here that two out of five from the same nest came back. Um, this story is, uh, this is, Audubon is the only source for this story. 
<laughs> and he is credited as the first bird bander in America. Okay. This is uh, so there's a big claim here, right? Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Well, Audubon was in France in 1806 when he claimed to have recited those birds. <laughs> Uh, I published a paper in the Archives of Natural History a few years ago where I showed this with primary sources. Um, and uh, yeah, that's another big red flag. Um, and let me tell you, by 1834, Audubon had an axe to grind, especially against the people of Philadelphia, the ornithologists of Philadelphia. And uh, the, the you might have heard of a guy named Alexander Wilson who came before Phil, uh, Audubon. So... Audubon, you know, he grew up there on the Schuylkill, but then he, he's only there for a couple of years. And part of that time he was in France, as we've seen. Uh, and then he went down, uh, lived in Kentucky for a while, uh, moved down to the south and, in, and eventually into Louisiana. And it wasn't until 1824 that he came north with a portfolio of paintings. And he decided that he was going to try to make a run of this ornithology thing and see if I could get my paintings engraved and published. And, and maybe this is a, up until this point, he's, he's got a general store in Kentucky for a while. He's painting people's portraits. He's, he's uh, doing sort of side hustles uh, while his wife is the governess for a, a plantation, multiple plantations. She sort of bounced around from plantation to plantation uh, in Natchez, Mississippi region. And uh, so she had a much more stable career than he did at that time. Uh, and her her stability was, uh, you know, important for raising their children uh, while he was kind of like, a, a, you know, out and about. So in 1824, he came to Philadelphia. With, with his portfolio. And this is a very important turning point in Audubon's career and in the career of, and in the history of American ornithology as we know it. And he showed, he had this opportunity there in Philadelphia to share his paintings and, his, and to hobnob with the intellectual elites of the United States of that era. Uh, Philadelphia is where the American Philosophical Society uh, was founded by Franklin in 1743. Uh, the Academy of Natural Sciences is founded in 1812 in Philadelphia. This is the hub of natural history and science in the United States. It started in Philly. It's all about the Quakers, but that's a whole other story. So the Academy established the modern standards that we use today in science. Um, this, you know, specimen evidence. If you're gonna claim that you discovered a new species, well, where is it, right? Bring it back. Lewis and Clark brought their specimens back to Philadelphia and put them in the museum. Alexander Wilson got specimens and put them in the museum, right? This is uh, the standards that we still follow today. Um, I've had the great fortune in my life to discover some new birds. And uh, guess what? I had to show them. I had to I had to present the specimen evidence before I could tell the world that I had discovered a new species or or subspecies of bird. Um, same so, so this goes all the way back to the academy and peer review started at the academy in 1817 with the first volume of their journal. Uh, so by the time Audubon was doing any ornithology at all uh, in public, the standards of modern scientific evidence were already in place. Okay. And of course, the academy is my alma mater. This is where I did my PhD uh, at uh, over the last 10 years or so. So Audubon then, not only did he get to show his paintings off to this community where there's philanthropists, potential business partners, uh, he's also kind of on the hunt for an engraver, uh, somebody to finance his publication, maybe to, to make it happen, right? Uh, and he, in Philly, there's lots of, Movers and shakers, right? Charles Lucien Bonaparte, 22 years old or something. He arrived in Philadelphia in spring of 1824 too. He showed up with specimens of the species now called Wilson Storm Petrel and brought them to the Academy. He got off the boat with specimens and was like, hey, everybody, I found a new Storm Petrel. Here it is, right? Um, Bonaparte right away started revising Wilson's ornithology and publishing and Bonaparte was publishing in the Academy's journal, submitting his work to peer review. 
Ford uh, was the executor of Wilson's estate. Wilson is an or American ornithologist, didn't really get into him yet. Uh, American ornithologist from 1808 to 1814, published a nine volume set called American Ornithology. Uh, and then he died real young uh, of the dysentery as the people did back then. Uh, and he, uh, so he had been dead, you know, 10 years before Audubon showed up in Philly looking for support. Uh, Ord was Wilson's executor and had finished the final two volumes of Wilson's work posthumously when after Wilson died. And then Ord in the 1820s was in the process of publishing a second edition of Wilson's Ornithology. And on top of that, Ord had also signed up to, to peer review all of Bonaparte's papers. And that's hundreds of pages of journal paper in the Academy's journal, technical papers revising the, ornith the, the nomenclature of Alexander Wilson. Very thankless job. Ord's name is not all over those papers. It's Bonaparte's name on those papers. But Ord must have spent a lot of time reviewing it, especially because this, you know, hotshot prince of Musignano or whatever came off the boat. And Ord is, uh, you know, a little skeptical of this uh, aristocratic uh, approach. And Bonaparte had a kind of attitude about him, as you might imagine. Uh, Edward Harris is a uh, from Morristown, New Jersey is a wealthy man, uh, becomes, befriends Audubon, is friends with Audubon all the way through uh, Audubon's lifetime. Harris uh, accompanied Audubon on the Missouri River Expedition in 1843, which was Audubon's last expedition. Um, Harris put up the money for a lot of specimens that John Kirk Townsend and other ornithologists who were traveling in the West came back and, and some of these things came up for sale. And Harris was the one who put up the money so that Audubon could get his act, get ha his hands on those things to describe them and to uh, illustrate them. And then over here on the far right is this guy, Reuben Haynes. And this is who Sally had mentioned earlier. This is the corresponding secretary of the academy. And he's a, he's a networker. He's the one who sent writing to all the naturalists here and there across the world and sending the academy's journal there and receiving specimens and, and reporting to them at the meetings. He's, uh, he's not publishing uh, his own research as much as he's the kind of the grease in the gears uh, that is making the academy work. And Haynes lived in Germantown at this wonderful house called the Wick House, which is 1690 foundation, one of the oldest houses standing in Philadelphia. And it this is this uh, drawing on the left was done by the French painter Milbert in 1824, same year that Audubon came to visit. So this uh, and Audubon came in July 1824. This is the 200th year. We're coming up on the date. Uh, hopefully I'll be speaking at WIC on July 24th or 25th this year, which is the 200th anniversary of Audubon's arrival at WIC. So I'm going to give a talk about Audubon at that auspicious day. Um, so Haynes is uh, the, the proprietor of WIC at this time. He's fifth generation. Wick was in the hands of a single family for nine generations for 300 years and amassed over 200,000 documents. The collection is now preserved in the American Philosophical Society Library. Now that window that that red arrow is pointing to, that's my bedroom window. Hmm. So I lived at Wick uh, twice, uh, two non-consecutive years in 2010 and then again in 2017. And in 2010, I was rummaging through the family's papers and just digging through filing cabinets, looking at stuff. Um, and I came across these uh, photocopies of these letters from John James Audubon. I said, oh, that's peculiar. And then I turned out the originals were in the collection of Rubin's great grand nephew at Haverford College Library. And no one, apparently no scholars had ever read them or transcribed them or talked about them in, and, and let me tell you, uh, there's a voracious appetite for Audubon uh, research, right? And to find five letters that no one had ever read or, or discussed in the literature uh, was something pretty impressive. And when I found those, I was, I was unprepared at that time to explain what they meant. And so I spent a good five years researching Audubon's, reading all the literature and researching it so that I could transcribe those letters. And, and, uh, and that was my very first paper about Audubon. And since then, I've published a dozen more. So this was, I published those in 2015. 
So I'm about 10 years in now. Now, things didn't go well for Audubon when he came to Philly. Not at all. Uh, turns out he was nominated for a membership at the Academy. Uh, and he left town July 31st. Two weeks later, he writes a letter to Thomas Sully, the, the portraitist. And he says, should you see honest Quaker Haynes, beg him to believe me, his friend. Should you see Mr. Ord, tell him I never was his enemy. What? Something's going on here. Like, what happened? Uh, things, something, something. Uh, and, and we're not getting the full story from Mr. Audubon. Now, in the bottom left, we see this ballot box with those little marbles, white marbles, black marbles. At the academy, when they vote for membership, all the members at the meeting would have a marble. They'd have a black and a, and a white, and they would go up to the box and put whichever one they wanted in. It's said that only one black marble in the box was sufficient to reject a nomination. Audubon was the only person rejected in the year 1824. There were, uh, I think, four other people, three other people nominated on the same day as him that hadn't accomplished anything in science. And they were accepted. So he was rejected in a very, which was very unusual. Uh, and you'll notice here, it says July 27th. This is the original ledger, uh, where the original ballot ledger, it's in the Academy's archives. July 27th, the nomination. August 31st was the rejection. Just happens to be my birthday. <laughs> happy happy birthday matt uh jj J. audubon natchez mississippi uh correspondent as a corresponding member and then you see on the right you see ca lesseur which is charles alexander lesseur the famous ichthyologist reuben haynes and isaiah lukens and isaiah lukens was the clock maker who uh who made the clock that uh that was placed in independence hall when that was renovated by william strickland in 1824 same year that Audubon came to town. And William Strickland also renovated Wick too. Um, so things did, something happened here. What happened? Well, George Ord was sitting in the vice president's chair that night. He was in charge of the election. And so there's been quite a lot of, uh, uh, you know, hypotheses about what might have, what went down. Right? What, were the Academy members jealous of Audubon's talent? That's one, one hypothesis was Ord afraid that Audubon's work was going to eclipse Wilson's work. And Ord was financially invested in this second edition of Wilson's Ornithology, right? So some folks said, oh, well, Audubon's paintings were so amazing that they, he felt threatened and, and, he, and he thwarted Audubon's uh, nomination, right? Or was it because Audubon was caught plagiarizing Wilson's painting of the Great Horned Owl? Well, William Dunlap in 1834 in The Rise and Fall of American Art, or whatever that book is called, Big, Big Tome, he told this story that he heard from Alexander Lawson, who was the engraver of Wilson's Ornithology. Audubon went to Lawson's workshop and showed him the plates, showed him the, his paintings before he showed them at the Academy. Uh, and come here, my dear, said Lawson to his daughter, bring down the horned owl. It was brought in Audubon's proved to be a copy from Wilson's, reversed and magnified. Uh, probably Ord got some word about this from Lawson during Audubon's visit that summer. Um, was it because Audubon didn't credit his friend Mason, uh, who drew some of the backgrounds on the paintings? That's been supposed, uh, you know, it's put, been put out there. Doesn't seem quite as bad as plagiarizing the Great Horned Owl, in my opinion, but you know, seems like there's a few different reasons why this might have gone down. Well, turns out none of these were the answer. None of these is the reason why Audubon was rejected. In the, in the American Philosophical Society Library, I found among a collection of papers belonging to George Orr uh, in 1830, when Audubon's book first came out, in the preface of that book, it says something to the effect of... Um, when I arrived in Europe, you know, honors that were that the Philadelphians refused me were freely given. You know, it was a little dig at Philadelphia, like Philly didn't recognize my genius kind of thing. Uh, well, uh, Ord was visiting England at that time and he looked, was looking at this and he said, uh, hold on a second. And he wrote down a testimony in 1830. Uh, and I'm going to read a little bit of it. 
The members of the Academy would have had no objection to Mr. Audubon, provided they had thought him to be an honest man. This is written in 1830. Okay? But when they were informed that he had barely traduced the character of one of their deceased associates, the illustrious Alexander Wilson, by publicly reporting that when the latter visited Louisville, he was hospitably entertained for two weeks at Audubon's home, received a just variety of valuable information from him with an account of some new species, all of which Wilson published to the world as his own without mentioning Audubon's name. When the members of the Academy were thus informed, they indignantly rejected the candidate. Although the proposal of membership was backed by Bonaparte, Charles Alexander Lesseur, and some more influential men. This determin ar determination arose from the fact of Wilson's manuscript diary having been produced, in which diary it appears that the author remained only five days in the town of Louisville, that he put up at one of the public hotels, that he called upon Mr. Audubon one morning for the purpose of seeing his drawings, and that he accompanied Mr. Audubon one afternoon on a shooting excursion, but that they got nothing new. And that finally he left the town with the persuasion that it did not contain one friend of science or literature. This is something like proof that Wilson, the discerning author of American ornithology, did not consider Monsieur Audubon either a man of science or of literature. Uh, this testimony was uh, just published last year for the first time. So I found this document in the American Philosophical Society Library and I blew the whistle. Red flag. <laughs> so Audubon goes to Scott, uh, goes to uh, Great Britain. First, he goes to Liverpool, makes his way up to Scotland, uh, immediately gets over there and he starts getting introduced to some of the uh, intelligentsia of the day. And he exhibits his paintings, gets some influential folks to put on exhibits. And he puts these things up on. And first painting on display is this bird of Washington or the great sea eagle. What the heck is this? Right. Falco Washingtoniensis, female. This is, he leads, this is his, this is right out of the gate. This is the first painting he's showing anybody in the exhibit. And it's in it. And this is a catalog published in 1826 on the left for this event. Well, this is the painting. It's a peculiar bird. It's an it's a eagle, right? Might kind of give you the vibes of a immature bald eagle, maybe kind of has this little little vibes of golden eagle happening um it's it's a weirdo well at the bottom there if you zoom in on the rock there's some annotations and audubon wrote drawn from nature in 1822 that's the tagline of alexander wilson in wilson's ornithology at the bottom of every plate it said drawn from nature because wilson had drawn from the specimen right directly that was the point uh, and that's, you know, the science of it, that, that, that my drawing wasn't from my imagination, but that I was accurately copying an object of nature. Um, now, here's something weird. He puts some measurements there and he said he is claiming that this new species has a 10 foot wingspan. <laughs> um, yeah, right. And if we go back and look at that catalog again, right below the, the, the bird of Washington is the white headed eagle. Right. This isn't the bald eagle. No, he's saying I found the largest eagle in North America and Wilson missed it, even though he traveled through its territory. Um, you know, Wilson must have been an inferior ornithologist to me. Essentially, that's what he's saying. Right? Now, another red flag. He, he annotated his painting male. And yet in the catalog, when he put it on display in, in Edinburgh, it said female. My guess with that is that the painting said male and somebody was like 10 foot wingspan. Like, really? Like that means, you know, in the other eagles, females are bigger than males. And that means that the female must be even bigger than 10 feet. <laughs> and that's like stretching the realm of credulity. Right. So here's uh, another red flag. This bird has 10 tail feathers. Yes. Eagles have 12 tail feathers. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's going on with that foot? Very strange foot anatomy. Doesn't look like an eagle foot that I've ever seen. Those those uh, scutes uh, go all the way down onto the toes. It's a really funny, funny looking eagle foot. In fact, I wouldn't call that an eagle foot at all. 
So some folks, you know, this bird has launched itself into the realm of cryptozoology. <laughs> um, was Audubon the last witness of a, of a species that's now extinct? You know, back in the Pleistocene, the megafauna, things were bigger back then, right? Audubon saw one of the last ones, last of these giant eagles. Uh, you know, this is right up there with Sasquatch and Nessie. No, he, he just plagiarized some cartoons from an encyclopedia. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, the simple, this is Occam's razor, right? Um, right here. Well, you know, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, those are Audubon's painting on the left, and these are two different editions. The, the black and white one in the middle is a uh, first edition of Rees's Cyclopedia, published in 1802 in London. And then the one on the right, uh, is on the far right, is the American edition published in 1806. And Wilson had actually worked as an editor on the American edition. So Wilson would have noticed Right. This is one of the crazy things. If Wilson was alive when Audubon tried to pull off the bird of Washington fraud, Wilson would have been would he would have been like, uh, you copied the image from Rees because I I edited it. You know, so Wilson was dead and Audubon was able to pull off his fraud because of that. So he publishes this fake species in a scientific journal. Why not? Right. With fake data a fake story about collecting a specimen. This is the first new species of Audubon's career. Plate 11 out of 435. This is how he launched the birds of America with a scientific fraud. Swainson proclaimed him a genius. Swainson was the leading ornithologist of Britain of the day. And he guilt-tripped the nobility into signing up for the Birds of America. I have long aimed at that perfection with which Mr. Audubon has so fully attained. On casting my eyes over the list of subscribers, it is with gratified feelings that I see his most gracious majesty at the head. Audubon swindled the King of England into signing up with this fake eagle. From the fine and original taste with which our king seems intuitively to possess, I question whether any of his subjects are better qualified to appreciate the merits of Mr. Audubon, the number of nobility who have followed the example of our sovereign as yet are few. I'll bet when he published this, which is this was published, right? This uh, little uh, um, opinion piece, uh, bet he got a lot more subscribers. So Audubon uh, was, was on his way. So he went all in, right? He got Robert Havel Jr., his engraver, after the first 10 plates. First 10 plates were engraved in, in Edinburgh by a guy named William Home Lizers. And things weren't going well. Lizers' team uh, was having, you know, why are we doing this? Why are we engraving these little birds under these giant pages? No one's going to buy it. And Audubon didn't have enough subscribers, right? He was right at the brink, and the whole thing was about to collapse when Bonaparte showed the paintings to the Royal Society and Bonaparte gave him the in, got him hooked up. And then, the, and then they kind of, well, man, this one's new. This one's different. Like you got to publish these. And so Audubon did, he went in and he pumped and Havel. So he switched engravers and he got Robert Havel Jr. In London to engrave the rest of the plates, the rest of the 425 plates. And this is the first plate that Havel engraved the bird of Washington. For the next 20 years, Audubon had to keep the long con going. Only way to do that was to spread rumors about specimen, lie to his friends and family. It gets deep. His, Harris, who gave him all that money, Harris was like writing him letters like, I was out, I, th I think I saw a bird of Washington. Like, I'm pretty sure, and, and Audubon's like, sure you did. Sure you did, right? It's like, man, like it, it got deep. And once you're so far in and you got all that, you're like your success is now tied to this fraud and you can't give it, you, you're all in now, right? So Audubon went all. Here's a Audubon's plagiarism of Alexander Wilson's Red Wing Black. Not only is the adult male at the top, uh, you know, pretty, pretty strongly ripped off, 
look at the the uh, female on the bottom left of Wilson's image in the bottom left of the screen. And then Audubon's on the right. Audubon said it was a juvenile. He <laughs> took, yeah, and Wilson had said, this is the adult female. And Audubon just ripped his drawing off and claimed it was a juvenile. Um, he, remember how the great horned owl was reversed and magnified, right? This is the Mississippi kite. Alexander Wilson's Mississippi kite on the left, which is which which was a new species in Wilson's work, and Audubon just flipped it. And just like the bird of Washington, right? There's a fraudulent so, uh, origin to the image, but then he dressed it up. He made the feathers look realistic because he's a great painter. And he could make that bird come to life and give it some attitude in its eyes like that furrowed brow on the bird of Washington, it has this regal thing to it, right? And of course he named it after George Washington, right? Because that was already an established, that was like an, an established symbol at the time. War of 1812 was finally wrapping up after 10 years and the, the Europeans were tired of pumping their money into America. And they were like, you know what? Why don't you just be independent? Right? Why don't you just, and, and so there was a, there was a, a wave of uh, American, um, you know, uh, interest in Britain at the time, and this, and uh, and in Europe, nobody had, you know, the scientists there, except for Bonaparte, no one had uh, intimate personal experience with the birds of America, and so it's hard to challenge someone and say that's that's fraud or that's not true if you can't, you don't have any other evidence to, you know, to refute it. Audubon even plagiarized himself. This is a weird one, right? This is on the bottom was published first as the is Eastern Meadowlark from Birds of America. And on the top is the lithograph from the Octavo edition, which says drawn from nature on it. Um, he clearly just copied the his first one. So and and Sterna neglecta, this is the Western Meadowlark. Um, that's a new species. And so Audubon is drawing the specimen of the new species. This is supposed to be, he's, he's drawing the type specimen of the species. No, he's, his, his type specimen, quote unquote, is, is this drawing of a different species that he did. And he just recolored it a little bit. Um, very bizarre. Swainson's like, oh no. Swainson started, he, he started to see the right on the law after a couple of years. He's like, oh no, what did I do? Many species in Audubon's book are too obscure to be admitted on the mere authority of drawings, which do not point out their specific characters. I thought he would have been an authority, but few men can transcendently excel in more than one branch. So far as technical science is concerned, it is in short, a complete failure. <laughs> he wrote this letter, Swainson wrote this to Bonaparte. But this was too late. Cat's out of the bag, right? Audubon already has been made a fellow of the Linnaean Society and the Zoological Society and all of the fan. Any and remember how I said pseudoscience is about dressing something that's not science up as science until it's indistinguishable, until you can't tell. Well, this is how he did it. He put FRSS. Right, he put the letters after his name on all of his books. This is the title page. He makes sure everybody knows he's a fellow of Linnaean and Zoological Society of London, member of the Lyceum and Linnaean Society of New York. Da, 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 da. And this list keeps growing and growing as his volumes go. And to the general public, man, this guy must know his stuff, right? You know, well, I, I had a PhD on my name when, on the title page of my talk. And you were probably, oh man, he's got a PhD. <laughs> so, so here we go, right? These these credentials are you're dressing yourself up for something. Um, here's Morton's hawk. This is kind of a funny thing, you know. Harris Harris is the guy who gives him all the money, right? And this is a bird we call Harris's hawk today, and that's because Audubon stole the specimen. Uh, there was this guy up in the corner, Jenkins. John, John Carmichael Jenkins, uh, he wasn't a great guy. Let's be honest. He he grew up in Pennsylvania. He was he went to the um, he went to University of Pennsylvania for medical school, and then he went down. His uncle was blind and passed away, and he went down and 
became a slaver for the rest of his life on his uncle's plantation in Mississippi. Um, this, but he became a member of the academy and he started collecting specimens and he sent this, he got this new hawk and he sent it to the academy with a description of it. And he wanted to name it after Samuel Morton, who was the secretary after Reuben Haynes died, Morton became the secretary. So he's going, he wants to name this thing Morton's hawk. Audubon took the specimen from Morton, quickly took it to Europe, published it as the Louisiana hawk, named it Beauty O'Harris Eye after, after Edward Harris. And in the original description of it, he claimed he didn't know where the specimen came from. And he claimed and, and totally left uh, Jenkins out. And this is passage from Jenkins' diary. Uh, a couple years later, he wrote in his diary, I shot a hawk today of the species Falco harrisi, or Louisiana hawk of Audubon, this bird is very seldom seen in this country, and the only specimen now in any museum or cabinets are the two that I shot. That is to say, the first one in October 1836 near Pinckneyville, in which I presented to the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. They both were females in full or adult age. Mr. Audubon obtained my first specimen and described and named it without my knowledge or consent. I had described and named this beautiful bird after my friend, Dr. Morton of Philadelphia. Um, is it better that, I mean, we, I'm glad that this bird's not called Morton's hawk. <laughs> let's, let's be honest. Morton was uh, was an a even more problematic figure. Um, the specimen was lost uh, until a few years ago when I rediscovered it. Uh, so that's the specimen uh, that was stolen by Audubon and it's in the Academy's collection. It was in the main collection uh, and it hadn't been identified as Audubon's bird because um, nobody had dug into this story at that point. Um, So here's, there's another story. Here's the Great Pine Swamp. Um, Audubon, 1831, right after he, uh, or right before he describes the bird of Washington, he tells this story about the Great Pine Swamp. He went to the Great Pine Swamp and he said he followed Wilson's track. Wilson had gone to the a place called the Great Pine Swamp in 1811. And he, uh, Audubon went back there. He said, I found the Great Pine Swamp. I followed Wilson's track. And I found all the rare species that Wilson found there. Because Wilson had published a bunch, a bunch of warbler species that, that uh, had, nobody had seen since. And Audubon went and he found them. That's great, right? Um, he said he found this place at Rockport, near Rockport, Pennsylvania. This is Lehigh River Gorge, uh, north of Jim Thorpe. Um, right outside of Rockport is a little town called Weatherly. And that's where my my great grandparents are buried in Weatherly. My family's from this from that region. Uh, so Audubon spent some time there. This is Carbon County, Pennsylvania, on the west side of the Lehigh River, and anthracite coal region. Right. Um, well, it, it turns out that I I went I followed I actually did it. I followed Wilson's track. I looked up his his notes in his book, and and I and I figured out. I looked at old maps, and I found out Wilson didn't go to the west side of the Lehigh River? Like not at all. He he went north of like from east and up toward Wilkes-Barre and went up over Pocono Mountain. His, the Great Pine Swamp was the Tunkhannock Creek watershed up up near uh you know Long Pond and and the uh, Fern uh Fern Fern Bog Preserve or something. There's it's a it's it's a swamp straight up. It's a fresh water. It's the headwaters of the Lehigh River actually. Um so I, I figured out, no, Audubon never went there. So what's going on here? Well, uh, so I just published this paper this year about it. Turns out, man, I went through every account of Audubon and I, I tried to give him the benefit of the doubt, but whoa. Like it turns out like almost all the facts in all of Audubon's accounts of these warblers, several different accounts in, the, in that volume, seem, they seem totally invented. Like these, these hemlock warblers, immature male Blackburnian warblers, are breeding in the non-breeding cage. Like, yeah. uh, right? Suddenly it's like, what uh, adult female black-throated blue warblers are attending a nest with eggs together. So Wilson had gone to the Great Pine Swamp in May during the spring migration. He didn't see anything nesting. And Wilson and Audubon went there during the breeding season while well, supposedly went to the Great Pine Swamp. He went to Rockport, right? And he got there and he was like, this isn't a swamp, it's just a forest. 
the great pine forest. Wilson was, Wilson, you know, he's implying that Wilson exaggerated his description of this swamp. <laughs> so it turns out there's a whole lot more red flags. Well, so we're, so when you're trying to, to sort this stuff out, you want to go to the primary sources, right? To try to, all right, if you're going to, if you're, if you suspect that Audubon might be fibbing, it's like, okay, where are the primary sources? Let's see if I can, and if I can, you know, I, I track, I went to the Great Pine Swamp with primary sources. And that's how I was able to show that he was lying. Well, here's a great example. Um, Audubon's diary transcripts, these are supposedly primary sources, right? Well, turns out his diaries went into his, his uh, widow's possession after his death. And then they made it into the possession of his granddaughter, Maria. Uh, and Maria published transcripts of the diaries and then destroyed the diaries. <laughs> Come on, right? Where there's smoke, there's a literal fire in this case. In this particular case, Lincoln, Sparrow, Audubon in 1833 went to Labrador, really Quebec. He never actually made it to the modern day Labrador. Uh, on this expedition with these young guys were his field assistants. And this guy, Lincoln, was about 21 years old or something, went with him. I found Lincoln's lost diary in a cabinet at the Delaware Museum. Right. John DuPont got his hands on it through a bookseller in California, and then it went into a cab. Nobody saw it again um, mm -hmm. until I found it. Um, so I'm getting ready to publish the full Tom Lincoln's full diary. Um, well, it turns out that the day that Audubon claimed that he personally discovered Lincoln Sparrow, he was out in the field and he heard a song that no, that was not the song, you know, a different different species song. He's like, I oh, know it's a new species. And then he called to his friends. He said, Lincoln, come over here. I found a new species, right? And they come all, and his son is there. He, they come over and then, and they shoot it and they get it. Uh, and Lincoln's the one who took the shot, and got the specimen. And in the field, in his stories, like they, they three, three cheers for Lincoln first for grabbing reds, this whole dramatic story. Except if you look at the diary transcripts that his wife published on the day that this supposedly happened, June 27, the morning dawned above rain and fogs, which so enveloped us that we could scarcely discern the shore, distant only 100 yards, drawing all day. Well, elsewhere in the diaries, Audubon says drawing all day. I stayed on board, drawing all day, right? Uh, one of Audubon's assistants, not Lincoln, another one, he he, he was like, yeah, like Mr. Audubon being almost all the time aboard at work did not have so good a knowledge of the moss of which he speaks as we boys did. For we were sent out to different distances from the ship to explore, to gather information, to hunt, to bring ourselves a new species of birds home at night. Mr. Audubon just stayed on board the whole time painting. We brought him the specimens at night. And that's what the diary says, drawing all day. But in this, but in the transcripts that Maria Audubon published, there's this whole long story that corroborates the, the text, the published account that Audubon published. Uh, there's pretty good evidence here that Maria Audubon doctored her grandfather's diary transcripts before destroying the diaries. And she admitted it. I burned it them myself in 1895. In this case, she was specifically talking about the 1824 journal, but the other ones are, were also in her possession and they're gone. Nobody, they're missing too. So presumably she burned them all. I had copied from them all I ever meant to give to the public. And if you will go back to that bitter year, you will understand why my mother, the other members of the family and Dr. Cass who read it all, thought that in view of the existing circumstances, fire was our only surety that many family details should be put beyond the reach of vandal hands. Mm -hmm. In this same in the same diary transcripts, uh, there are passages. There are some partial uh, some leaves from the diary that still exist in the Field Museum Library. Uh, and a and a researcher named Patterson several years ago looked over those. And the differences in those particular passages, uh, Maria Audubon had changed had doctored the transcript in a way that made her grandfather look more like a conservationist, more, uh, you know, improved his image um, before she destroyed the originals, right? So, so for, from the point of view of Audubon scholarship, this is 
very, very problematic. That the primary sources are tainted. The published sources are are you know fiction. Yeah, that's that's the word, right? Ord said the misrepresentations and lies of five enormous Octava volumes would severely tax the patience of him who should undertake to expose them, I can attest, <laughs> as well as of him who should listen to the detail, and I'm sure you can attest at this point, and we've just scratched the surface. Huh. Now, here's a great, this is a real cool thing that I got from Frank Berundo's diary. He was a Chester County historian. Um, but, and he went to this, he visited Whitmer Stone at the Academy back in about 1913 or something. And Stone had been, uh, had just talked with a, a descendant of Myers Fisher. And Fisher was a, a Philadelphia lawyer who, um, when Audubon first arrived in 1803 in the United States, he caught the yellow fever and he was nursed back to health in a hospital in Norristown by Quaker nurses. And then he went for convalescence with the Fisher family with Myers Fisher. And, and this story is passed down through their family. Audubon had a fashion of borrowing without leave Fisher's gun, among other things, and was knocked down by Fisher on one occasion for doing so. When expressly forbidden the use of it, Fisher characterized Audubon as one of the biggest liars in the country. And this is a, you know, very prominent Philadelphia lawyer. Uh, so this is where we're at, right? pseudoscience theories ideas explanations that are represented as scientific but that are not derived from science or the scientific method um i think right now in our culture we're at this point where uh there's um you know like he who shall not be named audubon claimed that he was born in several different places uh depending on who he was talking to he was born in louisiana or in france or or in Pennsylvania. Um, turned out he was actually born in Haiti. Um, really? Yeah, in Haiti. It took a while to figure that out. Uh, yep, and his father was a plantation owner in Haiti. Uh, so the uh, so it's a it's a complicated quagmire that I've been gradually wading into and and exposing over the over these years. Um, and uh, this is you know. I haven't mentioned slavery or racism once, <laughs> right? I haven't, and that, so the National Audubon Society, I'm sure you know, has been chatting about, you know, that they came out, they doubled down on Audubon uh, just last year. Um, they avoid my research like the plague. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, if you read their discussion of, their justification for keeping the name National Audubon Society, uh, they are, you know, according to them, courageously uh, in engaging with his racism and 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 legacy of white supremacy. Um, but hey, it goes a lot deeper than that. There's a whole lot of reasons why Audubon is a problem. Um, the biggest one of all is that he was a con artist, and we, our entire society was hoodwinked by this con artist and to so much that we named all of our most precious societies the society that care about that like focuses on conservation which is like the thing that we care about the most as naturalists and birders um that we uh, that we we named you know towns and streets and and you know not just the national society but all the regional societies um, it's really deep. And the, when when somebody is conned, they it's a humiliating experience to be conned, to, to admit that you were hoodwinked. Uh, Swainton, could, he could admit it to Bonaparte in a letter, but he wasn't about to, to broadcast it to the world because um, that reflected poorly on his judgment. Um, you know, and I think we're seeing a situation right now in our country where a lot of folks got conned and they feel humiliated. And some of them are doubling down uh, in a stubborn way just to preserve their own self dignity and self worth. Um, and so uh, I am one of the, the loudest proponents of changing the names of the birds of America. 
And I've been, I came out of the gate on that issue a long time ago, many years ago now. Um, and I've been very, I, I know there's a, you know, it's, it's hard to change our traditions and to, tr to change, uh, but sometimes, you know, it takes courage to say the emperor has no clothes, right? And that's the, that's what's going on here. The emperor has no clothes. So did he even yep. do his own paintings? Say? Did he do his own paintings? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, he was a great artist. He a great artist. And he was a great con artist. <laughs> Both. Yeah. At, of, of equal skill. Of okay. equal skill. Yeah. Um, and he con he conned a bunch of scientists. Scientists have a big ego, right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> scientists have big egos. And, and he conned them left and right. Generations of scientists he conned. There's there are living ornithologists today who can't who have they have skin in the game saying good things about Audubon and 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 defending Audubon, um, and they can't they can't admit that they were wrong, you know. How many of the folks from Cornell have admitted that the ivory bill woodpecker doesn't really exist? <laughs> Not very many, right? Because they were hoodwinked, and it's embarrassing to say that out loud that they were wrong. Um, especially when they've got letters on the end of their name. Um, so I think that here we're, we're the number one thing that distinguishes science from pseudoscience is that scientists revise their hypotheses when new data emerges. Here, a large amount of new data has emerged that is transforms the way we we interpret this man's life, the way we interpret his book, what um, the history of ornithology. Uh, and as scientists, I think we're called upon to revise our hypotheses and to revise and to, to stand up and say, hey, we were wrong. I grew up right across the river from Ottawa. When I found those letters at the Wick House, I felt cool by association. <laughs> I did. I was like, this is like, Audubon, like my hometown, like I felt so cool until I found, until I started going down that rabbit hole and it was like, oh man, like I was hoping too. So, so I think that this, uh, I, I'd love to take uh, more questions. Yeah. No, so I was going to say, did, did, has anybody come back, any of the people that are having trouble with this change, have any, have any of them tried to address it with any other real documentation that pushes back against what you're saying or not? Um, Could you repeat the question for the Zoom? Sure, sure. Yeah, I'll repeat this for the for the Zoom. Uh, the question is: Has any uh, has anybody tried to rebut my arguments or bring bring other evidence to the table? Um, there there is a author named Peter Logan who wrote a rebuttal argument to to my story about uh, Lincoln Sparrow. Uh, he wrote a very large tome. Uh, the title of which was, uh, you know, America's greatest naturalist in his voyage to Labrador. Uh, Mr. Logan uh, is commercially invested in the Audubon mythology with his book, and he gives talks around the country. And this is just the way that the the National Audubon Society is commercially invested in the Audubon brand, right? Uh, and so. And Mr. Logan, Peter Logan, is a he's a scholar. I've read his book. Uh, he pointed out in his article a couple silly mistakes that I made that during edits, these papers that I write are very dense in many, many pages and a lot of facts. And a couple, a couple things slipped, slipped through that were very minor and sort of peripheral things that, that I got wrong. And that's no problem. In my next paper, I'll acknowledge that, they, that I was wrong about those, those things and fix them and keep moving forward. Um, but the general thesis is untouched. Okay. Um, and, and it's very notable that in his rebuttal, he only focused on that one paper of mine and didn't even mention the, the whole body of work that I've produced over the last decade, including the Bird of Washington fraud, which is the, the main, uh, you know, that's the, the, the main thread that runs through Audubon's career is the long con. Right. Um, the Washington Eagle 
was there ever a specimen? There, mm-hmm. it was he alluded no. that there was no. there was no. never a real. There was no specimen. Only rumors of specimen. He told a story in his book about this. I mean, it's it's a long story full of dramatic language and a lot of adjectives um, that that make you feel something when you read it. Um, I go through this very in a lot of you know uh, exhaustive detail in a paper that I wrote in 2020. Well, um, so what did he say happened to this specimen? Because he claimed he had a specimen. Well, yeah, he claimed it, and then you know I just didn't, I don't have it anymore. But the painting is based on the specimen, so you're gonna have to take my word for it. And that's the way he was, you know, until later in his career when people started giving him a lot of flag for it. Um, and when that Washington Eagle never showed up, people were like, <laughs> that's why Swainton changed his mind. So, so, so. Question from the chat. Mm-hmm. Um, this is from Jeff Bueller. Uh, great talk, Matt. So how is it that Audubon was so revered, given that he had colleagues that knew of his fraud and rejected his membership to the Academy of Natural Sciences? Yep. So a cat, the rejection at the Academy happened two, three years before Audubon published anything. So this is sort of the beginning. He didn't, Audubon didn't share that information. He mm-hmm. alluded to it in his book, but ne- it, that was an embarrassing thing for him. Um, it wasn't really until scholars later on, uh, and well, Ord was the number one antagonist, we might say, against Audubon. But remember, Ord was the, he was the proponent of peer review at the academy, and he was, he saw Audubon as a threat to scientific ornithology. Um, and so the... I think a lot, the real answer to this question has to do with marketing. Audubon's paintings are great. They really are, There's right? They they evoke emotion in you. When you see them, you can't help but be moved. There's energy in the paintings. If, look at the mockingbird and the, the rattlesnake attacking the mockingbird. Now, look at the red-shouldered hawk diving on the partridges. It's like, whoa, you can feel the wind in the painting. It's incredible. That's how con artists work. It's called con artists because it's confidence artist. Confidence is a feeling that you get. The con, the con artist gives you a feeling. That feeling overrides your judgment. And Audubon's work is just feeling upon feeling upon feeling. 435 paintings that are going to knock your socks off. Right? Except for a couple. <laughs> Which are, there's a couple lame ones, but... <laughs> First of all, thank you. Great research, and great presentation. Um, not my question, but I grew up outside of Norristown. <clears throat> As a kid, went to Audubon Shrine. I paddled at Rockport. I mean, this is like cool. And it's artistry is beautiful. From a marketing perspective, they place value on the name of a brand like Coke mm-hmm. or Audubon. Mm-hmm. It would be interesting to add to your presentation the valuation of the Audubon brand. And that's the whole reason they weren't willing to mm-hmm. it. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, let's be honest. The Audubon Society has done amazing things over the last century. And they've, they've contributed to that brand. That brand isn't only this guy from the 19th century. Um, see, the problem, though, is that as you, as the, as the research continues and the the uh, the facade is exposed, suddenly the this brand um, you can't unlearn that, right? So when I was in Philly, I was leading birding trips and environmental education uh, activities with Philadelphia youth and African American youth in the city. And there, we're chatting, we're out birding, and we're talking about things. And, and of course, Audubon comes up, and we start talking about that. And once they re, once they learn that uh, that Audubon was was actively, you know, digging up Native American remains and bringing them back to Philadelphia to Samuel Morton at the Academy, who was filling the skulls with seeds so he could prove uh, the racial superiority of whites. Um, this was this is something I haven't gotten into in this talk, yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm sorry I didn't. But yeah, there was this whole body snatching scheme 
there was this whole body snatching scheme and and i it's it's part of this right uh john townsend was a quaker kid from chester county went who went west with thomas nuttall in 1834 on the wyeth's expedition to the rocky mountains and they went all the way to, they got all the way to to uh the mouth of the columbia river there's like all these mammals and birds named after townsend townsend solitaire townsend's uh warbler all of these townsend's brown squirrel right townsend was digging up skulls he was he was cutting the skulls off of kids and and like trying to get the chief's grave and he got it but he couldn't but he lost the mandible and so he wrote to morton like i got the skull but i'm, I'm so sorry like I, i'm sure that this guy was a really high-ranking chief because his grave was full of them special stuff but i but i lost the mandible and i couldn't find it and i dug my hands around in the dirt for for a few minutes looking for it but like the people here they know that they they've seen me sneaking around the cemetery and they're like he knew what he was doing was wrong <laughs> he knew it and they brought that those skulls back to philadelphia and audubon did the same thing on the missouri river expedition and when audubon went to, to gallison's texas he he picked up the skulls of slain soldiers from the battle of san jacinto so there was that and that that uh morton let's be honest read more the academy's history was written like morton was the objectivist of his age come on no read his book and it's just dripping with racial prejudice and in South Carolina, when Alexander Stevens gives the cornerstone address, which which launches this, the Confederacy, and he proclaims to the world that this is the first time in history that a government is formed based on the scientific truth that the Negro is inferior to the white man. This is this is something that it's been in dispute for a while. It's not in dispute anymore. Science is on our side. He's alluding to the skulls. He's alluding to Morton's Crania Americana and the skull business. So Morton, Audubon is mixed up in this. Um, the, the crazy thing, right, is with all of this, go, going back to Jeff's question about how in the world did this guy get so popular, right? It was all marketing and these images and the paint, the paintings. And he got he became publicly famous among non-scientists, so much so that the scientists, it you know, if they spoke out, everybody's like, Ord, come on, go, go back into your whole Ord, you know, uh, stop, stop, uh, you know, mm -hmm. stop harassing this man who is a genius of our time and a great artist. And, you know, um, it's just, yeah, it's despicable. The deeper you go with this, with stories and, and, you know, there's even a story in ornithological biography called The Runaway Slave where Audubon encounters a runaway slave while he's out in the field, guess what he does? He gets him and he returns him to the master. His best, fr his best friend in South Carolina is Reverend John Backman, Backman's warbler, extinct species. Backman is like, you know, self-professed white supremacist. I'm going back to the question of the names of everything. I think I heard a year or so ago that there are, are a lot of bird names that are going to be changed. They're going back and looking at them. So are they just skipping all the Audubon stuff or is that are, is this their there are, sly way of starting to fix the names? There are a few birds named after Audubon. There are birds named after Townsend. There's birds named after a lot of people, right? We don't know. Some of them may be truly benevolent people. Um, some of them are not. For a long time, we would put Audubon in the benevolent category. Um, so, so our opinions maybe change about people over time. So, the, uh, hmm? remember more about what I had read or heard that the names are going to be more truly descriptive. So, we're going to lose the Townsends. Or so, so the, a committee was formed. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I, I'll give you a little bit of this. This is very modern history. Um, I think about 2018, there was a, uh, the, the truth is the dispute over some of these names goes way back. There used to be a bird called Old Squaw, which is a racial slur uh, against Native American women, uh, renamed to the Long-Tailed Duck. Um, there were members of the, the nomenclatural committee that decides these matters. Uh, that's 
you know, uh, these are senior members of the American Ornithological Union, Ornithologist Union is now the American Ornithological Society. And they, but in these deliberations in these meetings over changing names, there's some things that were said that are, uh, you know, the reasoning for wanting to keep these old names that are problematic. Um, so uh, around 2018, there was a, a graduate student named Robert Driver, and he's a friend of mine, courageous guy. And he put in, he wrote a proposal to that, that committee to uh, proposing to change the name of McCown's Long Spur because John McCown was a was a officer in the Confederate Army and uh, you know did a bunch of stuff that nobody really wants to be associated with, right? Uh, this uh, first the committee rejected it. Um, when when Rob first put this proposal forward, I read it and I was in the middle of this research. I knew a lot of stuff. I knew a lot about this dirt on the skull, the whole, the body snatching and the, uh, and the slavery. Um, and I had been wrestling with it myself. I'm, I was a graduate student too. And I got news for you, you know, la being a loud mouth graduate student, you know, calling out your home institution for their historic racism. It's not a good look. <laughs> and Rob did it. And he put himself right out there for the slaughter. And I went to the, the meeting of the AOS, which in uh, Anchorage, Alaska that year. And I, and I talked to Rob there. That was the topic of the day at that meeting. Um, I wrote a rebuttal to his proposal and I put it on my blog. And not that many people look at my blog. So I didn't think, think that much of it. Uh, I wrote this rebuttal of it. And it was sort of like, hey, just, just saying like, this is kind of a slippery slope. Not sure we want to go down this road because like, I got news for you. McCown's not the worst actor. Um, and uh, and then I talked to Rob and I thought about it like a little bit more. And a month or so later, I was like, you know what? I was wrong. Like Rob's right. He's just being courageous. I'm just afraid. I'm afraid of what the consequences are if I speak out, especially because I'm at the Academy. And so I, so I did. I spoke out and I said, hey, we need to change the names, all of them. And I came down hard on that line. And I said, even Bick, Bick Nell's thrush, Nate, all of them. I don't care whether the, we, we need to wipe the slate clean, unburden the future generation with this stuff. And and I called out the academy. Um, the So I, I exposed the, so that blog started getting a lot of traction. A lot of people started going to it, thousands of visitors. And uh, I wrote, George Floyd was murdered the following spring. And I wrote, and at this point I was like, I'm all in. And I published a blog uh, about the skeletons in the closet of American on the um, where I drew the, the link between the skull uh, business and the Confederacy in the cornerstone address. I drew that line for the first time and thousands of people started coming to the to the page um a year so it was like maybe a year after we started so uh so i got into <laughs> seeker committee was formed at the academy <laughs> to deal with this issue um uh some allies of mine whispered in my ear who was on the seeker committee and that had been formed and so i forced myself onto that committee <laughs> and i we had a lot of really intense conversations with with my mentors and my bosses and, and um thankfully i was a very productive student of ornithology and i was publishing a lot of good research and i had some capital um so i was able to speak out in a way that maybe some of the other grad students weren't going to be able to um some students over at penn read the blog and they started, uh, they, oh, that's what's in those cabinets. <laughs> uh, so a student movement started over at Penn, uh, another grassroots movement. Um, and about a year, so in those conversations with the academy, I was very clear with them right from the beginning, this is what we have to do. We need to pressure Penn to re repatriate these materials to the tribes. I had, I had drafted letters to the tribes 
I had looked up their information and was, I, I was like, if nothing else, like there, so there, there's a, a law called the NAGPRA Act from 1996, I think. And it says in that law that if you take federal money, um, you, and you, uh, you're by law required to repatriate materials from your museum if you take federal dollars, something like that. And I looked it up and sure enough, Penn had gotten $200,000 worth of the funding from the federal government to CT scan the skulls from Mort. Um, so I was like, we, we got to get this moving. Um, so I, I got pushed back from the academy, obviously. Um, or just, uh, but that movement over at Penn continued to grow. And eventually that student movement put so much pressure from inside on Penn, that Penn came out uh, about a year later, maybe, and publicly apologized for it. And, and, and uh, they, and the next day, the Academy of Natural Sciences publicly apologized for it, for funding the expeditions to steal these, these materials. We gotta be really clear about this. Those, those remains are people that their descendants are alive in Oregon, in California, in Oklahoma. Like, it's like their great grandkids are there alive. These aren't some like fossil remains of some, right? No, these are like people's ancestors uh, that are directly tied to these people that are living. Um, and, and just recently in the, uh, there were there were enslaved men and women that were also their skulls were in that collection uh to and disgraced to to have their remains be used for pseudoscience to prove racial superiority that is so evil so evil. so um did you know when you read the, the stories or the basically biographies so of Audubon you see all these stories of how he collected specimens and dissected them and looked at the musculature and the skeletons and blah, 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 before he did his drawings. Do you think he did any of them real? Sure. Okay. I think some of it's real. Yeah, he definitely had specimens, of, okay. but, but not of everything. And the stories, and you can't, you can't decide what's true and what's not. Pick a sentence. Yeah. Flip through the book and just open it up and put your finger down on a sentence. Is it true or not? 50-50. Maybe not even 50-50. And then my <laughs> other just comment is, as you read the history of all of these explorers and discoverers from a certain period of time in our history, in a lot of histories, there were they were ruthless. I mean, there were a lot of ruthless discoverers out there. I mean... Yep. Hey, <laughs> let's... let. I want to be real honest here, is that during this, I also retraced my family ancestry, right? Up until five years ago, if you asked me what my ancestry was, I would have told you, oh, yeah, we came from Slovakia like 100 years ago. Like we weren't we weren't part of that whole genocide thing or the enslave enslaving our neighbors. Um, well, I got news for you. No, I'm actually descended from Plymouth Colony. And I'll bet every white person in this room is descended from Plymouth Colony mm -hmm. along one of your ancestral lines. And because every generation, the number of ancestors uh doubles. It, it doubles so that's an exponential so by the time you get back 10 generations to plymouth colony you've got a thousand direct ancestors and so the number so we pick and we pick and choose you could have over a million ancestors. we pick and choose which of those lines are the stories we want to tell and to to self-identify with but i have my my eighth great grandfather was was died in the Oyster Creek massacre in New Hampshire and was scalped and ran through a gauntlet of Native American warriors. Oh, wow. And it's, and I lived with a Native American tribe in Panama for five months when I was first doing biology, you know, 15 years ago. And I didn't, I didn't even know that context when I was there. And so, uh, that we're we're venturing into some into some dark places. <laughs> Brian probably has something interesting to say. I'd really, really uh, plug in on a question. So there's a at the American Philosophical Society Museum right now. They just opened an exhibition that's about natural history of this period. Gets into some of the ornithology and the nefarious history. You can see also one of uh, the spec the actual hawk specimen that mostly used for a particular hawk species. The actual 
one itself. So it's at the at which the, one is it? Forget which one. Rod Wing Hawk. Yeah. But it's um next to the actual um okay. the book itself as well. It's free, it's right down in um in the Independence Hall. Question is, you know, so you're a you're a scientist, but you're also a, and a historian of scientists. I'm wondering about like so you've exposed a lot of the scientific fraud. Is one of the reasons that there's difficulty of people holding on to it? Is, is, is there a me good mechanism for hard science getting correction out of historical research? No. And so there's not. Well, broader mm -hmm. questions are scientists having difficulty with this, or is it historians of scientists who have to do it? Thank you. Answer. Repeat the question. <laughs> yes, yep. Yeah. That was a really cool question. Um, <laughs> it's a question about being a his historian and science. A lot of this, so I do scientific research, but I also do historical research. And sometimes the historical research shines a light on the science uh, at, that, um, you know, can we trust the scientific descriptions of Audubon? There's 20 some species that he's the authority of. Um, the, those aren't gonna change. Um, there, this, you know, in, in zoology, we have this thing called the principle of priority and in nomenclature, whoever describes something first gets the name, right? That's theoretically what's supposed to happen until the second half of the 20th century. Um, people were like, you know, we don't want to change any more names ever again. So if, if something, sh if, if, if you find that this, so during my PhD, I realized that Thomas Nuttall, who had described what we now call Swainton's thrush, Catharis ustulatus, based on a specimen that Townsend brought back from, from Oregon, um, turns out it was a hermit thrush. <laughs> so the name Turtus ustulatus was actually based on a hermit thrush. It wasn't, it wasn't a Swainton's thrush after all. And so in my paper, I wrote it up and I was like, uh, guys, like, you know, hermit thrush, like, the name Ustulatus is a synonym of Gutatus, the, the hermit thrush, and the, the actual the actual Swainton's thrush doesn't even have a real name. And so I gave it a name in my paper. Did it stick? The reviewers had a coronary. <laughs> they lost their mind. I had a reviewer like, you can't do this if you... You are, if you do this, I will go to the ICZN and petition them to override your, your paper and, and to, to, to force that name to stay the way it is. <laughs> Taxonomists do yeah. this all the time, change things if they find something so, fire. So, and so there's a, there's a uh, kind of an emergency break call, uh, where you can, a neotype, they call it, where you can des designate a new specimen that, and, and attach it to an old name and, and it, it patches up the wound and we're going to go forward. The funny thing though, is now with the thrushes, the ones, the species that I studied, I've neotyped like four of them because none of them were described correctly. <laughs> if we actually followed the principle of priority, I would have named new species of thrushes and, and done it the way that the old ornithologists did it, but I'm not allowed to do that anymore. So, so scientific ornithology is, is, you're 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 uh it's sort of over that 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 era of describe unless you find something really new no historical information that you dig up is gonna uh is gonna be able to change anything uh if unless because there's gonna they're gonna pull the the emergency brake uh you know we, we uh, manual override let's let's pretend like that's not happening um and so yeah, so we're kind of stuck with these names that are that weren't actually described correctly. Um, and so a lot of the historical literature is wrong, not true, full of errors. Um, and but we've deified these people. And so we can't we can't possibly change one of the names. I mean, because then we would be erasing history. Many people right? did it. <laughs> Maybe one more yeah. question, and then we can just meet informally. There's one. Uh, this is slightly off topic, but, but when I heard you were going to be here, I read a novel that I cannot remember what it was, but Bonfon was a real scoundrel on this one, in this novel. Mm -hmm. He had a minor part. Do you have any idea what it was? I don't know. That sounds like... That's good. You know... <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't one of my papers. <laughs> the name, there are 
people who who's who, who are revered as great practitioners of what they were doing, whether it was a composer, a sculptor, you name it, a, a railroad designer, who, who are also horrible people. <laughs> I would like to close by plugging my friend's book. I haven't even read this book yet. I've read a couple chapters of it in a little preview, but uh, Ken Kaufman has a new book coming out in May, and it's called uh, The Birds That Audubon Missed, I think. Oh. Ken, came, Ken flew to Philadelphia from Ohio to spend a day with me and to interview me, and, to, and I took him around to, the, to Mill Grove, and we went to Bartram's Garden, and we went all over, and, and we talked about this stuff, and I've been sharing my papers with Ken over the last few years while he's been working on this book uh, to give him, and he's he's seen stuff that I haven't published yet, um, just to give his, uh, so Ken is a really, he's a level-headed guy. He's a really level-headed guy, and he doesn't jump to conclusions. Um, I think he's gonna do, a, I think his book is gonna be great. I haven't read it yet, like I said, but I, I think he's gonna treat these topics with sensitivity, and also with uh, some smarts. Um, so I think it, it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to fly off the shelves. It's coming out in May. What's, yeah. what's the, the book? Ken Kaufman. Ken Kaufman, 